Hello, and thank you for exploring Lakehead International's videos. My name is Jordan, and I am the International New and Social Media Officer. I'm also the host of the Lakehead International Live series, a fun and informative way for you to connect with current international students, professors, and ask questions about admissions and everything Lakehead. You are about to watch a recording from one of our previous live sessions. If any questions arise throughout the video, please do not hesitate to comment below. If you would like to check out some of our upcoming live sessions, please head over to our website at lakeheadu.ca forward slash international dash live. Let's begin. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to another Lakehead International Live. My name is Jordan. I'll be your host today. Of course, we're joined together for our International Lecture Showcase series. Today's session is actually about direct-to-consumer genetic testing. I'm joined by Dr. Robert Mowinney, one of our professors in the Department of Chemistry, and previous to that, the Department of Bioinformatics. Before we get going and uh, actually pass it over to him, I'll do a quick introduction to myself. For those of you who haven't joined before, my name is Jordan Ball. I am the International New and Social Media Officer here at Lakehead University. I help run our live events, our digital experiences, as well as our social media channel. I'll pass over to Dr. Marwini to introduce himself, and then I'll chat briefly about our uh, reminders for today's session. Thank you, Jordan. So my name is Dr. Robert Marwini. I am a professor in the Department of Chemistry. <clears throat> I was formerly the coordinator of the bioinformatics program. In fact, I was the one who developed the idea from start to the beginnings of the program. I'm currently the coordinator for graduate studies in the chemistry department, which includes both a master's and a PhD program. Over to you, Jordan. Awesome, thank you so much. So like I said, before we actually pass it over for the lecture, I'll remind our viewers of some friendly things. If you like which scene we are recording today's session, so we will be sending out a link afterwards. If you get our weekly Evite emails, you'll get the link in there. If not, you can always head over to our YouTube link at university and check out the recording there. If you have questions, you can always comment using Zoom's Q&A functionality, and we always love live conversation. Um, if you do have questions and you're watching this as a recording on our YouTube channel, you can always comment on that video and we will follow up. And last but not least, I'll encourage you to stay connected and follow us on our social media channels. You can find us at Lakehead International, both on Instagram and Facebook. And I, of course, I run those channels, so I'm always pushing some of our important updates from the university, as well as offering fun and exciting opportunities for you to get started and get more connected to Lakehead. And on that note, I'll pass over to uh, Robert to begin his lecture. So today I want to talk to you about direct consumer genetic testing. Um, just a little prelude to this. So right now I'm going to focus on about a 30 minute long lecture. If you are an undergraduate student at Lakehead, normally first year students, uh, the lectures are 60 minutes long. And when you get into second year and up years, we're actually 90 minutes long. So this is a very abbreviated version of a lecture. <clears throat> so the later lecture is going to be that I'm going to sort of present to you the idea of genetic testing, why it's interesting to everybody. And then I'm going to sort of give you sort of the background behind the genetic information that we have in various organisms. And then I'll sort of do a short little poll, sort of just sort of pop quiz. <clears throat> and then I'll go into some work that one of our graduate students, one of our undergraduate students did as part of our capstone project. <clears throat> So um, we will briefly be mentioning some consumer products. And so I want to highlight that they are not affiliated or endorsed by Lakehead University. <clears throat> so genetic testing is <clears throat> a very, very common thing nowadays. So as you can see by this <clears throat> graph on the number of tests that have actually been sold, <clears throat> You can see that it actually is growing exponentially. <clears throat> so the number of tests coming out there is growing and growing and growing. <clears throat> now, the reason why this is growing is because by knowing your own personal genetics, you can understand information about what's happening with your health, as well as some of the common traits associated with the genes that you have. <clears throat> and then probably the most common thing is to understand where you evolved from, so what your ancestry is. <clears throat> so these tests are marketed directly to you. And so you find them in magazines, you'll find them on TV, you'll find them on the internet. <clears throat> and basically you order a 
um, kit from the company. They send it to you. And from there, you do a DNA swab. So you use a little cheek swab you will use. You send it into the company. They process it. <clears throat> and then you receive normally a written report, usually in the mail, which usually gives you a link to, or at least a, something you can type in for a, accessing a secure website, where you can actually download the raw data. Now, some of the companies that are sort of most often used now are the CRI Genetics, Ancestry, 23andMe, although I believe Heritage is also another one used. used. Okay, so what is this raw data? So the raw data gives you basically a list of the A's, C's, D's, and G's that are part of your DNA. So just as a reminder, DNA is made up of a phosphate background connected through a sugar. The important part is your base pairs or your bases that are involved in the backbone. Okay? These can be broken up into either being a purine or a pyrimidine. And so you can see we have adenosine for A, guanine for G, cytosine for C, and thymine for T. And so those are your four different base pairs, the four possible bases, but they form this complementary pairing when they go into forming your DNA helix. So what you'll notice pretty quickly is that you have a combination of a purine, so an adenine, and a primitive basis. So that's your connectivity. And you also connect guanine with cytosine. And those are your two sort of common things that hold them together. And they sort of bind everything together. So let's play with that. That's just the basics of what we have. Now, from an organism perspective, a genome is basically all the genetic information they have. So it's the complete set of genetic information. And from that information, it allows any organism to basically function. So it controls everything that an organism does from the large scale down to the cellular level, okay? From a human perspective, our genome has 23 pairs of chromosomes. And those 23 pairs are made up of your 22 normal chromosomes plus your sex chromosomes, X and Y, two X for the here male and an XY if you're a female. And each of those chromosomes has, be, has between 200 and 2,000 genes, okay? Noting that a gene is just a region of the DNA that will code for what we call RNA, or ribonucleic acid. So basically, if you take DNA and you add a couple of OHs onto the sugar, you've got RNA. Now you can, RNA molecules themselves actually do some work. So you might've heard of mRNA vaccines recently. This is a thing can actually do some work. But most often mRNA actually gets converted into an amino acid sequence. So it takes three amino, three um, base, bases, you put them together and you read them coming off and it corresponds to a particular amino acid. So there are 20 amino acids over here. Here you can see that the CAP corresponds to a histidine. So we have it, this one here will correspond to a histidine. And so it'll be just one of the amino acids that it codes for, okay? The genetic code itself basically tells you how all these combinations of three possible DNA bases lead to all the 20 different amino acids. So as you can see on the right here, there are 20 amino acids. So proteins themselves are very, very important. Now note that proteins are polymers that are made up of the individual amino acid monomers. So each of the three pair bases code for an amino acid, it gets added to the chain. And so you start getting what we call a primary protein structure. This is just basically each of the individual um, amino acids added together to form a long chain. 
Now, each of the amino acids is connected through a peptide bond. So a C double bond ON, where you lose water in forming your peptide bond. <laughs> and because you're forming a polymer, we call it a polypeptide because it's made up of many, many, many peptide bonds. Okay. <clears throat> now, the reason proteins are so important is because while DNA is the information that tells you how your cell and your organism is going to work, the proteins are the ones that do all the work. So any reaction that takes place is usually going to be catalyzed or sped up by a protein. Any stimulus that might be happening to the cell or to the organism, <clears throat> the protein will change its shape or something and therefore be able to respond to the stimuli. In that sense, they act as signaling molecules. That's why they sig signal to the molecule they signal to the cell on what they need to do. They also are active in terms of transporting molecules within and between cells. They help to replicate the DNA. In fact, actually the DNA, when it's sort of in the nucleus, it's wrapped around a protein already just to make sure it's all stabilized and keep it all nice and compact, okay? And additionally, they form structures within the cells. So for example, down here, we can see three types of proteins. So a peripheral protein, so that's sort of just sitting on the edge of the um, cell structure or the phospholipid bilayer. That sort of, sort of is the interface between cells or between one side of the cell and the other. So these peripheral ones can act, for example, from a signaling perspective. They can change shape and therefore change the structure of your cell. You also have these integral proteins, so they actually sort of go from one side to the other, and they act as sort of a, a scaffold for holding it together a little bit better. And then finally, we have these channel proteins, which allow molecules to be transported from one side of the cell to the other, either actively or passively. Now, as we said, proteins, the polymer themselves form these primary structures, but they can wrap around for other kinds of complexes. And so if you put enough of them together, you can either form a pleated sheet, often known as a beta sheet, or you'll get an alpha helix. And then there will be regions of, regions of the protein backbone that are not forming pleated sheets or alpha helixes. And so that allows them to fold up into a tertiary protein structure. This tertiary protein structure is important to how the protein is going to function. Now, many times what will happen is you'll have more than one protein interacting with each other. And so this leads to what we call a quaternary protein structure, which is basically a complex of one or more, or sorry, two or more. <laughs> complex of two or more proteins. <clears throat> now, as you saw, we have 23 chromosomes, each with millions and millions and millions of base pairs, they start to code. And so basically what we'll find is that the human genome itself, it has somewhere between 20 and 30,000 genes. And those genes code for over a half a million different proteins. So as I said, proteins are the workhorse for any organism. And so there are many, many, many of them. Now, as we saw, these tertiary complex, quaternary complexes form is formed by more than one protein. Well, in fact, the majority of proteins, by over 80% of them, operate in complexes when they're doing stuff. Okay. And so here's an example of complexes from three different organisms. So you have a streptococcus, a bacillus, as well as a homo sapien version of them. And all three, and again, the protein sizes and what they're made of will vary because the genome is different, but in the end, you'll get these complexes formed in such a way. Now, these complexes evolve over time, starting with a, sort of an early evolution where you have this weak interaction between a couple of proteins, eventually evolving to the point where you get a strong interaction, and therefore, it becomes a very important feature in terms of how the organism works, because it's evolved with the organism. So these very, very strong interactions or these ones here are known as the wild-type protein complexes. 
And they're basically what we would see normally. Any variation is going to be a mutant from that. Now, these protein-protein interactions, so weak or strong no matter what, they evolve over time. And the rate of this, as well as how well they interact, leads to an organism's fitness. Okay. Now, we've been talking about 80% of the complexes, but 20% of them are actually still stable, well full of proteins all by themselves. But the other 80% need or require or, the, or found only as part of this protein complex, these sometimes are known as obligate complexes. Okay, so as I mentioned, as we evolve, you see some mutants come on, and all of a sudden it might make stuff for something stronger. And so some sort of genetic information with respect to that. An LL is a variant form of a gene. So instead of a sort of normal one, it's slightly different. And polymorphism is basically the fact that in a particular population, there may be two or more different LL situations, so variants that exist, okay? And so now we can look at this from a very simple perspective or as a larger perspective. So at the very, very sort of um, molecular level, again, we can see this, that we have these single nu nucleotide variants, okay? So these are variants where you're substituting just a single nucleotide for another. And there's sort of like, we have them all the time. So. Over here on the right, you can see that in this case here, we've had the single nucleotide replacement. So we're replacing A for a C. Okay. Now, there's a special case when these single nucleotide variants are present in at least 1% of the population. When they are, then we have a specific word for that. It was a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP. And this is sort of a major issue in terms of trying to understand the health effects of any variation. Now, when you do have a change in the base, I, you have a nucleotide substitution, now two things can happen. Either the same code or the code that corresponds to the three amino acids with the one change, the codes from the same amino acid. So there's no change an amino acid, and then it's a synonymous change in the sense that it has no effect on what's going on with the protein. Now, if you have a substitution where there actually is a change in the amino acid, then we call this the non-synonymous change in the sense that they're not synonyms for each other in the sense that they're now coding for a different protein. So as, again, going over to this picture on the right here, you can see that the CAT gave you a histidine, whereas the CCT gives you a code. So all of a sudden, this would be an example of a non-synonymous single nucleotide variant or SNP if it was like in 1% of the population. Now these changes may or may not affect the functioning of your protein and therefore they may, may or may not be pathogenic. So sort of talking about something currently going in the world. So we have the SARS-CoV-2 genome that we've been working on. And you'll hear about all these variants of concern. So this is what's happening here. So really what's happening, we're focusing on is the spike protein, because that is a point that allows for infection to take place. And so basically what happens is you have, if you have a non-synonymous change in the spike protein, what may happen is it may become more infectious. If it is more infectious, then it's going to spread more. Okay. So as we said, if we have this single nucleotide variant that is present in at least 1% of the population, and it leads to an amino acid substitution, we're going to call this a non-synonymous single nucleotide polymorphism. So remember that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Each chromosome can code for many, many, many proteins. And what happens is a lot of these proteins form these protein complexes. And so proteins from different chromosomes often form protein complexes. 
This is known as by mapping these out, we can get our PPI network. So our protein protein interaction network. And so this is an example of one over here. So here you can see your 22 amino acids or your 22 chromosomes plus your sex chromosomes. And you can see, for example, here, I'm just gonna focus on one particular one. So you can see that one of the proteins that is um, produced from chromosome one, and here I'm gonna focus on here, it actually interacts with one of the chromosomes that it's coded for from chromosome 19. And so all of a sudden now you have the fact that a change in one um, single nucleotide on one chromosome and a change on a single nucleotide on another one can have an effect. And so now you have to think about this in a very complicated way. Okay. Now to understand what the effects are, we usually try to measure this through thermo some thermodynamic measure. Okay. And this can give us whether, you know, is it, is this, even though we have a change in the protein structure, does it change the thermodynamics, i.e., does it still have the same stability or is it less or more stable? If it's more stable, then it's going to have an influence. Well, my, if it's less stable, it's going to have less of an influence. And to measure this, we use what we call a delta delta G. And so this is dif the difference between the binding affinity in the mutant versus in the wild type protein. So if we compare this earlier version of it, to this later one. So this is our wild type. And we'll call this our mutant. The delta delta G would be how well this the binding, so how strong this interaction is here versus how strong the interaction is here. And that's what we're measuring with the delta delta G. So again, the binding affinity in cells are basically represented by delta G. So this is the strength of the interaction. So so the delta G would be large in the top case of a strong interaction, the delta G is small for a weak interaction. Now, in terms of what we want to do in terms of this DNA, so there are in vivo, there are in vitro methods that are very costly, they take a long time. In silico, especially with the um, improvement in computational power, these two techniques allow us to sort of get a feel for how the delta delta G is changing. Now, in silico techniques, normally fall under two categories molecular dynamics, which are very, very expensive, and these knowledge based ones, which are considerably cheaper. And so, we're going to focus on these knowledge based methods. Um, or, this is the student that I'm going to talk about in a bit. We're focused on this. And these are based on what we call machine learning. And so basically, they use a training data set they, on a set of known situations and then extrapolate that out into unknown situations to make sure that we can get a better method of doing it. And they're usually pretty quick. You might have heard of neural nets. Which is a type of machine learning. Okay. And so basically, if we see that the, again, we saw the delta G mutant is small, the delta G of the wild type is large. And so, therefore, in this case here, the stronger interaction, you're going to have a negative value because the delta G wild type is larger. Okay. And so the sign will look basically classify the effect mutation, i.e. is it more or less stabilizing effect on this protein-protein interaction. Okay, so I've given you a lot of information so far. And so now I'm going to sort of get Jordan to get a poll. So I have four questions for you based on the material we've gone so far. So the first question will be which base pairs complement one another. So we covered that early on in the lecture. Remembering that you, there are four base pairs. One, for, there's a pair from pyridines, a pair from pyrimidines, and the pyridines um, complement the pyrimidines. Second right, question. So results are, are flowing in right now. It looks like we have one strong contender uh, for the most votes so far, but we'll give the audience uh, a few more minutes here to, or a few more seconds, I should say, to submit their answers. Uh, 
All righty. So I'll end this poll um, and I will share the results with everyone. So the, the strongest contender or the one that was voted on most was A and T and C and G. Um, but we won't reveal the results quite yet. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll do the secondary question. I'll pass back to uh, Robert. So the second question is how many chromosomes does a human genome have? So remembering that we have a base set of chromosomes, plus we have our sex chromosomes, and it's and we have we have a specific number, and this is all the information that codes for everything that leads to the proteins that function and therefore dictate how an organism functions. Awesome. So I'll wrap up this poll. It looks like we have another uh, winner here in this sense, or at least most votes. It's not necessarily the right answer, though. So we have 23 with eight votes and 32 with two. And then I'll share those results quickly just so everyone can see them. And then I'll do the third question here. So remembering that I gave a, a approximate value, so I'm, I'm looking for the specific value or I said greater than, but just assume that it's not greater than, okay? So again, we have, we have a certain net set of genes that come out of these, we have, we have so many chromosomes, each of those chromosomes has a certain set of genes, and those genes can code for a number of proteins. And so there are a lot of different versions of this, and so there's all kinds of proteins. Bearing proteins make up the majority of, do the majority of the work in any organism. So we need a lot of them. Awesome. So I'll wrap up that poll. I'll share the results. Uh, strongest uh, vote was for the 20,000. We had a few for that 100, um, one for the 250, and one for 500. So we'll see those results in just a second. And last but not least, our fourth and final question. Okay. So this is sort of a, I won't say it's a trick question, but I, like I could have made it a trick question. So basically what I'm asking, it's a yes, no, you know, is an SNP also an SMD? Remembering that an SMP has a specific nature to it. So this is sort of like a Venn diagram, if you want. If you want to think mathematics, I like math. So, you know, that's kind of the way I, I, I roll. This one was neck and neck, but now uh, one is leading. So I'll uh, wrap this poll up here um, and I'll share those results once again. So the no's have it at six to four. Um, I'll stop sharing the results. I'll pass back to Robert and he'll reveal the results on the next slide here. Okay. So, as you can see, in this, we have, again, we have for the base pairs, we have adenine pairing with thymine and guanine pair, pairing with cytosine. So that's your A, T, and G, C. There are 23 chromosomes in the human genome, or pairs of chromosomes. So. I, I didn't put a trick question. So I could have put 46 in the list, but I didn't because it's pairs. I said chromosomes. In fact, it should have been 46 because they're pairs of chromosomes, but we'll leave it at 23 for now. And again, as I said, proteins make up the, or do the majority of the work, and we need a lot of them. And so while 20,000, between 20,000, we have 20,000 to 30,000 genes, they home for up to 500,000 different proteins. And then remember the definition of an SNP. An SNP is an SND, but only if it's present in at least 1% of the population. So an SNP is always an SND, but an SND is not always an SNP. Awesome. Okay. So based on those results, it looks like the first three, the audience took the cake. They were able to guess that. Um, Pardon me, the, the first two, and then two. the last one, the third one about uh, the genome codes, 
that one had one audience member who caught that correct and then the yeses actually were the minority in the final question but they were uh the winners of my mini pop quiz so congratulations to everyone for that okay so that's the basic information i want to talk about what's going on here so now i want to move towards a some work a student recent graduate of our biopress program some of the work she did in her honor thesis. so when you do a, an undergraduate degree in science at Lincoln University, normally it's an honors degree and there's usually a capstone project. And so usually you're going to work with a researcher on a research project. So this is something that's never been done before. And in this case here, Kaneo, she wanted to work on developing a web application. And so this student wrote all of the code, um, including importing of databases and um, making sure that the code and the website associated with was, was accessibly compliant, okay? So the student did a lot of work. Her goal was to predict the effect of the non-synonymous, and here we're going to talk about single nu nucleotide variants in the sense that she's not only working on SMP, but she also wants to look at it even smaller than that, because um, if it's not 1% of the population, we actually don't have a lot of information, so she's trying to add that to it. And she wants to be able to pull in a raw genotype data from one of these direct to consumer um, raw data files and assess the binding affinity basically for the variants that might occur in your population. So remember, or in terms of what you get in the raw text file, and again, this is a text file. So this is just going to be a text file. So what you get is being a text file with four columns or five columns if you want. The first column basically tells you some reference number. And this is usually has to do with the, so um, if you go online, you can look at these SNP databases and they reference all these different ones. And so there are hundreds of thousands of these. Each of these is associated with a chromosome. And so the second column tells you which chromosome it comes from. Finally, remembering that each chromosome is rather long. So we're talking hundreds of millions of base pairs in a chromosome in some cases. And so this actually tells you the position on the chromosome where this variation might be occurring. And then it tells you what your data is. So what are so remember you have two strands, remember you've got a pair of chromosomes. And so therefore, in this sense, on one side you have one, on one side you have the other. And so you can see that in some of these cases, GG is the same, in other cases it's different. And so sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different when they go from them. Okay, so once you have this te text file, what Kelly did is she created this web application where you can, I, you can choose to browse if you want the system but in this case here what you can do is upload a file again to your data so she didn't want anybody to you know worry about having access to the data so basically nobody accesses your data it gets deleted after 24 hours or by you when you end the session oops sorry i did see my screen here and so basically, if you upload your file, you'll get a, what looks like over here. So basically, you'll get a file with a list of where you, oh, where you can look at, you can choose a particular chromosome, or you can look at all of them. And then for each of them, you're going to have a long list. And on this list, you'll have various ones here, and you'll have what chromosome is on, the position, what your genotype is what the possible substitution is, what gene it codes for, or maybe what protein it codes for, and how often these things occur, any substitutions occur. Okay, and so you can choose whichever one you want. In this case here, we're gonna do an example. We're gonna look at this HFE gene. So by searching on a particular gene, we can pick up, look at a particular one. So here we can pick up those four entries for this. You can see. You can see that we have first ones GG, CG, GG, GG. 
So you can see that in the, fir the first one and the low two, we don't see any transitions. But we do see that in, your, in this genome, we actually have one of these substitutions. So we're going to focus on this one and analyze the data. Okay? So when we click Analyze, what happens is it goes out and searches a database, and it tells you some information on this. And so here is this SNP that we pulled from, and it gives you all kinds of information about it. I'm not going to go through all the data. This would take a long time to go through all of it. The main thing that I'll focus on is that they, all of them basically tell, tell you that it codes for when you have this variation, it codes for what's known as hemochromatosis. So basically what that means is that actually build up of iron in your system. So when you go through a medical metal detector at the airport, you might send it off. There are other medical so things associated with it, but that's one of the things that's sort of most common that you have to live with. Okay. Some other information that tells you how often the substitutions are. So both at the nucleic acids, so we saw both there's a C to G and a C to T version of it, and then when it codes for what the most common changes in terms of the protein to protein changes are. So, for example, the first one is a hit cell into an asparagine, as well as it tells you how frequently this occurs in the population based on two projects. What is the thousand genome projects and what is the half project? And this sort of information you get. And then you have the choice of calculating your delta delta G. And so this is the knowledge-based approach. And so basically, again, it, it, it queries a couple of databases and pulls back some information. So when you click on your delta delta G, what it does is it takes some time to do, and I'm not going to run through, this is why I'm just showing you snapshots from it, because this would have taken a bit of time to run the interface. And so basically what you'll get is some information in terms of, from each of these knowledge-based approaches, you're going to find out whether it's an increase or decrease in stability. In this case here, the consensus is a decrease. And so basically having these mutations decreases the protein protein interaction. But there's another additional component to it in the sense that there are two protein structures we can look at. So down here, we have the 1DE4 structure. Similarly, over here, we have 1DE4 structure. So they look the same. And now we can look at the various proteins that can be interacting. And so we can look at the HFE protein and how it interacts with either the TFR1 human or the B2MG human protein that comes in. And so you can see in this case here, down here, the one that we've calculated the delta delta G for, we've calculated for the HFE with the TFR1, but we could also calculate with the 1DE4 and the BM, B2MG, or we could have gone to a different structure and then calculated with a different one of those two. And so if we want to recalculate based on one of these other variants, we can. Finally, what you get is a summary of all your data. Okay. So the take home message is that these raw data files can provide a lot of additional information. Um, there are a lot of third party options here. This here is one thing uh, you can look at and you can get additional information through various web applications. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. That was uh, really intriguing to see, obviously, of course, in those uh, take home DNA testing kits or genetic testing kits, you get that high level result. And I know lots of people do it for the purposes of sort of knowing where they come from and what their where their genes are from uh, geographically around the world. But it's interesting to see that obviously using some of these other external applications, you can really dive into those results and probably go down a few wormholes or, or uh, get really looped into it. But it's definitely uh, worth your while and, and makes more value out of paying for one of those testings. Thank you for checking out today's video. If you have any questions, you can always comment below. Stay connected and follow us on our social media channels to stay informed about upcoming webinars and get an insider sneak peek of Lakehead University. See you next time.